I'm Donna McCord and I am the volunteer for the Green Tent this afternoon. Tonight, uh, our keynote speaker is Mr. Toby Hemingway. And uh, his uh, keynote speech today is on how um, permaculture can save humanity and the earth, but not civilization. He is the author of a book called Gaius Garden. Gaius Garden, excuse me, and has been the world's best, it has been the world's best selling on permaculture for the past six years. A design approach based on um, ecology for creating sustainable landscapes, homes, communities, and workplaces. He is also an ad hoc professor in the School of Graduate Education at Portland State University. He's a scholar in residence at, at Pacific University and a biologist consult, consultant for the I'm sorry, I don't know this word. Um, Mimicry Guide. Toby teaches, consults, and lectures on permaculture and ecological design throughout the U.S. and other countries. He, his writing has appeared in magazines such as Whole Earth Review, Natural Home, and Kitchen Gardener. He lives in Portland, Oregon, where he is developing sites and resources for urban, urban sustainability. Welcome, Toby. Thank you all for coming. Thanks very much to the Renewable Energy Roundup folks for inviting me. All right, thank you. Yes, how is that doing for sound? I tend to walk around a lot, so I may just pick this thing up, and uh, that'll make me feel a lot more comfortable. All right, can everyone in the back hear just fine? Is that, it's a silly question, because if you can't hear, are you going to know what I said? But it's the, it's the standard speaker's question. All right, so the the title of this talk is somewhat whimsical, but the talk itself, well, the trajectory of the talk is, is kind of into some doom and gloom for a while, and then just about the time you're ready to slit your wrists, we're going to come back out of it, so I promise we're going to end on a positive note, so just stay with me there, I'll watch the depression level in the audience here. So. First, I want to start with the word sustainability and look at what it means, because it means a lot of different things. It's quite the buzzword these days, and it's being used in many, many different ways. So I want to start with the, the kind of academic and official definition of it, which is the, uh, the United Nations defines sustainable development, which in itself strikes me as an oxymoron. How can something be developing and be sustainable at the same time? But at any rate, the UN says, that it's development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future, future generations to meet their own needs. And I want to stop and look at that word needs there a bit because it's a pretty slippery term. You know, I mean, we get to meet our own needs and then in the future, the future gets to meet their needs. Hopefully we've met our needs in the right way. So let's, let's look at the word need. I need, I need this every morning, right? My half-calf, quarter inch of foam, chocolate sprinkles on the top, latte, right? I need, I need one of those. But a little bit less, less uh, facetiously, okay, I have friends who drive really big cars, and they're definitely green-type folks, and they're into sustainability, and so I did a little survey of, okay, why, why are you driving such a great big car when you know that it's you know, all doing all the things that it's doing? And... Their answer is, well, I need it because I run the carpool for work, or I need it because my kid's in a band and we have to take all of her equipment around, or I need it because I have a big family and that sort of thing, or I need it because I don't feel safe in a small car and having just had a driver's side accident, T-bone, a few days ago, I don't feel safe in a small car, but, so I get this, I get these needs but it just means that the word need is very slippery. You know, we need to have a big family because we're farmers and that's our job security for the future and for the old age and it's our labor force on the farm. Or we need an air conditioner because it's really hot and I'm really grateful for the weather the last couple days here. I understand it's gonna be a little bit toastier so we'll crank our air conditioners back on. Maybe not out here. But this is what the word need means. It can be really, really slippery, right? It gets to mean what, what you want it to mean. So I'd like to look at sustainability in a different way rather than talking about needs. 
the way I think of the word sustainable is that it's a midpoint in a way between doing things that are degenerative, things that break things down, things that cause pollution, and things that are regenerative, things that heal the earth, things that build things back up, things that leave things better, activities that leave things better off than they were. And nature is a pretty good model for a lot of sustainable and regenerative activities. So that's, that's really where I turn for things like that. But I really think of sustainability as a midpoint between all the degenerative <coughs> things that we've been doing and all the regenerative things that we need to do. And the word sustainable itself, I mean, you get to keep on doing it over and over again and everything's gonna work out fine. It's just, it's not that great, right? I mean, if someone says, how's your marriage? And you say, well, it's sustainable. <laughs> not a happy relationship. So I think we need, need, there's that word again, it would be a good idea to move towards regenerative activities. Another way to look at sustainable is we want, it's things that we want to keep doing over and over again for a long time. Forever, really, is what sustainable means. So what does that mean in terms of, of human activities, of the things that we do? Now, how long have we been doing the things that we do, and how much longer can we keep on doing them? If you look at the history of life on Earth, I mean, life is, the scientists say, about 3.8 billion years old, and it's been changing and evolving over time. So I want to look at, I mean, that's a long time, so let's look at something a little bit more meaningful to us in terms of just human culture. Now, how long have we, human beings, been doing the things that we do? How old is our culture? How far back do things go to recognize that it's still human? And so let's look at some of the hallmarks of human culture. There's tool making, and the first tools show up about two million years ago or so. People were making tools two million years ago. That's pretty recognizably human. I mean, animals use tools in some ways, but we use tools a lot. We are chipping stones and all that for two million years. Another hallmark of being human is, is the controlled use of fire, and that goes back about 800,000 years ago or so. Pretty long time that we've been working with fire in a, in a fairly controlled way. Or if you look at the lineage of human beings, if you look at our, our anthropological history, the genus Homo, as in Homo sapiens, shows up about a million and a half to a million years ago, something like that, depends on who you talk to. Here we go. So I'm going to pick a million years as the age of human culture. That's how long we've been doing things that are recognizably human. So let's let's look at those things a little bit. And what I'd like to do is use a little a little prop here, a little device. This is it looks like a ball of yarn. It's actually a time machine. Say a kind of low tech time machine. And we're going to go back in time using this ball of yarn. The way this works is every foot on this ball of yarn is 10,000 years. The yarn itself is 100 feet long, so 10,000 years per foot times 100, that's a million years. So this ball of yarn is gonna take us a million years back into the past. That means that every inch is about 800 years going back into the past. The distance between you and the person next to you when you hand this ball of yarn to them, because that's what we're gonna do, I'm gonna pass it around. The distance between you and the person next to you is about 20,000 years. They're 20,000 years distant from you in time with this ball of yarn. So I'm gonna just pass it out here. If we could just pass that around and wind it around the room, make sure it crosses the aisle, that sort of thing. And just, yeah, maybe going that way, good idea. So hold on to it and just unwind it and pass it around. And just remember that as it comes to you, you're going back a million years into the past, about 20 or 30,000 years in between each person. A single lifetime isn't even really visible. 80 years isn't even really visible on that ball of yarn. That's how far back we're going. So let's look at the things that make us human. I mean, we've been weaving baskets and sitting around doing crafts together for a million years, a whole million years of that. And we're still doing it. Modern people still sit around and do crafts together. It's a, social activities like that are a huge piece of the human. We've been doing that for as long as this ball of yarn is going around. We've been making music together, a really huge cultural activity of people. 
for a million years. That's in our bones, that's in our blood for a million years. We've been doing art for a very long time. These paintings are only 40,000 years old, but there's art that's much, much older than that. Very important by being human, sitting around together, making beautiful